Are we building too much? Are we building in the wrong place? Are we using the wrong materials? These are all questions we need to openly be having as a range of professionals involved in the built environment. We need to stop um, thinking in the same way that has created these problems, okay? By having that same mindset and approaching the problems with the same mindset that created them is not gonna provide us a solution. Hello, and welcome to BE Sustainable, where we turn complex ideas about sustainability into real-world solutions for the built environment. On today's episode, we're joined by Dr. Graham Larson. Graham is the Associate Dean for Sustainability at UCEM. He's also Visiting Professor at RMIT Australia, a Fellow of the Chartered Institute of Building as a Chartered Construction Manager. And Graham also holds a key strategic international role within the prestigious International Council for Research and Innovation in Building and Construction as coordinator for Working Group 65, Organisation and Management in Construction. Graham, welcome. Thank you, Mike. We talk a lot about innovation, and it's actually a core part of you, the MSC that, uh, that you lead at UCM. What are some of the most exciting and interesting innovations in the sector right now? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of exciting innovations going on in the construction sector. Um, the, the sector's often seen as or described as not being very innovative, but in actual fact it is, it's just that we need to look in the right place. Okay, so there's innovations around uh, digital practices and a whole range of those around 3D printing, around AI. Um, but there's also innovation around connecting those with the on-site activities. So um, exoskeletons, um, sensory work, and how we manage data. There is a, is a range of other um, innovations around perhaps the materials themselves. So lightweight technology, lightweight, um, low carbon materials and how they're used, how they're used in the circular economy. But part of the challenge is where those innovations are actually coming from, Mike. Okay, well, then let's explore that. Where are these innovations coming from? There's a range of innovations that actually come from just problem solving and mm -hmm. problem solving on project level. Okay, so they're there to actually uh, solve a unique problem to that type of project. Uh, they're discrete. Um, they're done in an ad hoc basis. They're perhaps not catalogued in the way we would hope. And they tend to be lost. And that is one of the challenges we have. When we think um, in terms of uh, the technologies, as we were saying, I think there's a lot of work being done around uh, sensors and data. If we compare, as we often do, the construction sector to the automotive sector, if we think about a car in um, uh, 1924 compared to a car in 2024, it looks very different. Mm -hmm. It's all sensor technology driven. If we think about what a building looks like between those time periods, it doesn't look that different. Uh, so I think there's a, a whole raft of innovations coming in around how we digitize buildings and how we embed them in the connectivity within a building, which is really important. Okay. And these innovations that are being developed at the project level and the local level, are they scalable to help us move towards a more sustainable built environment? In a word, I think the answer is yes, they are scalable. Okay. Um, I think it's important for us to think where the innovations are coming from. And um, like many sectors, the, the built environment sector is um, institutionalized in the way it does things. And we often need to look at perhaps what we would describe as maybe the outsider or the maverick and how they go about bringing in and creating new innovative ideas mm -hmm. and challenge those kind of norms within the sector. And that's really important for us. Thanks, Graham. So are the bigger players in the industry picking up on these innovations? They are, um, but the, the bigger players, have, whilst they're well-resourced and they do have R&D departments uh, to a point, they're also locked into doing things in a certain way. They are at what we would describe as um, the regime level or the, or the meso level okay, of understanding this problem. The real innovators, I would suggest, are actually at the niche level. They are those outsiders that I talked about, those mavericks mm -hmm. who can work outside of perhaps some of the regulations, um, some of the guidance and so on, and then start to reshape some of that regulation and guidance. But they need to then work with the larger firms to allow them to become um, the normal service, to allow them to be adopted, as it were. Okay. Is this a restriction on uptake then? Is this part of a reason why why these aren't these innovations are not being instantly used in an agile way? In a word, yes. When we look at 
any of the research or any of the studies around innovation. We can't talk about innovation without talking about uptake, diffusion, adaptation and adoption. Um, the whole way we think about innovation is quite complicated. There's issues around identity. There's issues around um, having to unlearn how we did things and relearn to do something new, which creates a particular dynamic. And um, the uptake is certainly part of the challenge. It's a, it's a double-sided coin, the innovation and the uptake. I think one interesting perspective on this is how these innovations that start out by the sound of it relatively small scale, how they move beyond that, that proof of concept into regular or consistent usage. How does that play out? There's a number of ways that can play out, but I think one of the most useful explanations for that is around this idea of um, closure and how an innovation reaches stability, a point of stability. Um, so it, let's take, for example, an exoskeleton. An exoskeletons, which are now being used in the sector, they could be um, perceived as a piece of um, PPE, okay, where they could be mandated. So that would mean that the uptake would unfold in a particular way. But exoskeletons could also be seen as just a, a tool that somebody uses, like in their toolbox, a regular thing, and everybody has one, in which case it wouldn't be regulated, it wouldn't be um, taken up in the same fashion. Or it could be they could be um, conceptualised as um, a piece of site plant. So in the same way as a, as a crane or other pieces of site plant are regulated and you need to have a licence, etc., and certain training to use them, that would mean that uptake evolves in a slightly different way again. And it's as an innovation reaches this point of stability or closure where it gets accepted about how we're going to perceive it, that's when the larger companies, the larger organisations, etc., will be able to play their role in help diffuse the actual innovation across the sector. Okay, interesting. Does that, the different ways of classifying some of these innovations then lead to issues with top-down regulation? If, if an exoskeleton is PPE, it is regulated presumably by... Mm health and safety perspective, um, if it's a tool, it's regulated elsewhere, if it's something else. What are the top-down regulatory restrictions on this? Is that throttling innovation at any level? I don't think it's throttling innovation, as it were. I think um, a lot of the, the, the trajectory, I think, of regulation over the last um, few decades has been around, in actual fact, loosening regulation. And it's been around... Um, light touch on um, how we innovate and what we can do and what we can't do. And I think there's an agenda around that, around performance, around improving programs, improving efficiency and so on. And I think there's a quite a complicated conversation to have around that relationship um, in exactly what the role of regulation is. I don't think there's particular aspects that are there to really stimulate the, re the innovation in the way we really want. You know, nobody's against innovation. But it's what we need to have is those conversations around how we get the uptake that we want. Is there any way that regu the regulatory environment could stimulate innovation or, or is it re does it require the, the entrepreneurial approach at that project level? The, the project level is an interesting, interesting point you raise because we tend to think in terms of buildings, in terms of isolated projects. And if we're trying to make the construction sector more innovative, I think we do need to think beyond isolated projects and think around the sector as a whole. Um, if we just think about an innovation, it's always got elements of risk attached to it. Mm -hmm. It has risk and uncertainty, okay, because it's new to the adopting entity. And what we tend to see is we tend to see that risk and uncertainty being cascaded down the supply chain. So what we end up with is the risk uh, being allocated to and managed by the, the actors that have got the, the least amount of resources to mitigate against that risk. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the challenge. If we had regulation and guidance around where that risk should reside across the construction sector, we might see a different appetite. So... Taking all of that into account, what's the solution? <laughs> it's a very good question. I'm not sure the solution has one particular uh, direct answer for that. I think there's a range of options available to us. Um, one option is possibly around the idea of um, what we would describe as service-led procurement. Um, the reason for that is really around how we financially manage the risk associated with innovation. Okay. Um, so in, instead of us simply purchasing, perhaps, I don't know, the lighting system for a building, what we can do is we can enter into a long-term service agreement whereby the lighting is provided. We purchase the right to light, 
Okay. What that does is it allows us to set up a, a long-term financial relationship that enables um, innovation to be encouraged and supported. And the uh, the procurement agreement could have improvements in the lighting every few years, whereby the light fittings are replaced, et cetera, and so on. Um, And that is an alternative into simply buying one-off widgets, um, one-off lighting units, et cetera. And that can be used across a whole range of uh, building components. It's used in manufacturing, Rolls-Royce, Boeing, um, Boeing buy the right to uh, flight. They don't buy engines. It, is there a risk from that of a degree of built-in obsolescence and therefore waste? That That is a risk, but um, that would allow us to think in terms of circularity. It would allow us to think in terms of um, how we can think about the built environment beyond isolated projects, okay, and beyond isolated buildings. So... Um, if, if a lighting system becomes um, not performing to the specification that the client wants because of the new innovations, that can be stripped out and it can be repurposed in another building to fit that person's specification. So what we see then is we see buildings as a, a, a bank of materials mm-hmm. in a circular economy to help us reduce waste. Thanks, Graham. Could we expand a little bit on material banks and material passports um, for the for the audience at home? Sure. Yeah. Um, These are gaining traction at the moment in the sector. And there's lots of consultancies, um, some we're working with here, that are looking at um, material passports, understanding where the materials have come from, from a start, how they've been um, manufactured, where the raw materials have come from. So actually tracing the entire um, process rather than I've just purchased this material and it's sustainable. Okay, Um, that's one of the elements that then works in conjunction with this idea of a building being a bank of materials that can be used in the future. So it's not a one off use of the components that make up that building. But the fact that they've been manufactured once means that they should be repurposed and reused in other buildings. Okay, Um, and I think as we move towards reuse and recycle, we can start to see buildings as playing an integral part in that. Okay. And then that presumably plays well into what you were talking about a few minutes ago around thinking bigger than individual projects, but mm-hmm. thinking about the macro, thinking about communities and cities um, and how materials have a have a life beyond an individual yeah. building. Yeah. Ab- absolutely. I think um, that leads us into thinking about concepts around strategic briefing rather than just uh, project briefing and thinking about what, you know, we we as consumers of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a town, of a village, of a city, of society generally, what we need. What does our society need in its built infrastructure? And if we think in those terms, we can deliver it. If we think in terms of isolated project, it makes it slightly more difficult. And to bring this to life, I imagine this affects all of the professions involved in this from design and architecture through the construction phase and actually then through even facilities management and, and use of buildings. How far has the industry got to go to, to be able to embrace this? There, there is work being done. There are, there are organisations, there are companies, there are you know, consultancies, etc. There are stakeholders that are trying to push the boundaries. Okay, They are interested in... What, what a client wants and what a, what a city needs. Um, the, you know, the client could be the city, for example. Um, but I think there are, um, there are real challenges. There are steps that need to be taken. And um, understanding stakeholders' interests, I think, is very, very important. The professional bodies of the sector play a huge role. Mm-hmm. Currently, um, they can be a force for good, mm-hmm. but they can also isolate the sector at times. They can put um, people in a silo mentality at times. So we need to work on that. We need to work together. So following on from that, if there is a a change of mindset around all of this, is this an opportunity to think more holistically about innovation, potentially to almost commission innovation, but also to be able to consider innovation across the entire industry, factor in any thought about any potential unintended consequences and so on? It it, it is. And I think um, the the undesired unintended consequences are something we need to be very mindful of. Um, we, we need what um, we would describe as responsible innovation. 
Okay. Mm. It's not simply a case of we must be innovative. We must release these innovations onto the sector as quickly as possible. Uh, we need to be mindful of what impact they will have, what impact they will have on current practices, on current legislation, on um, current organizational structures, financial structures, et cetera. And that's really important for us to um, have that responsibility. We, at the end of the day, are... Um, we are responsible for the sector. We are the custodians of the built environment sector. Everybody has to experience what we build, what we educate people to build, et cetera, and so on. And that is an enormous responsibility. What do you think is the biggest sustainability problem facing the built environment? Is service-led procurement and, and thinking strategically the solution? It's a good point, Mike. The the lack of long-term policy and lack of long-term strategy for the sector is, is a major challenge. We don't have a lot of industrial strategic thinking around the construction sector at all. Uh, we have you know, a, a government system based around four-year cycles, stop-start policy from the government. Um, it takes organisations a long time to respond to some of that, and they can be changed quite quickly. And that doesn't give them a lot of reassurance and confidence in which direction they should be going at times. Regarding kind of buildings, uh, you know, the, the, the whole nature of, of actually building something and using up the finite resources that we have on the planet is fundamentally a challenge for us, of course. Um, are we building too much? Are we building in the wrong place? Are we using the wrong materials? These are all questions we need to openly be having as a range of professionals involved in the built environment. And as I say, use the term, we are custodians for that, and we should be having them in an open, honest manner. The word responsibility comes through loud and clear, I think, in, in, in all of that and in, in a lot of what you're saying. How is a, an industry made up of a vast range of um, chartered bodies, of, of commercial firms, of, of individuals, of, mm. of small practice architects and so on? How, how do we bring that responsibility to bear as an industry? Part of the answer to that, I think, rel uh, relates to the rhetoric around the sector over the last however many years, 20, 30 years, I think we need to change our mindset. We need to stop um, thinking in the same way that has created these problems, okay? By having that same mindset and approaching the problems with the same mindset that created them is not going to provide us a solution, okay. okay? So we need a bit of a paradigm shift. And one of the ways, obviously, to do that is around education and around getting both the, the colleges, the universities, the schools, um, and, and then the professional bodies to take a step back and think holistically about the problem and have more collaboration. But we also need more collaboration with government, government policy and more um, strategic thinking in that respect around the construction sector. And, and thinking longer than the end of the current, current parliamentary term or the end of the current five-year plan. It needs to be a, a longer range. It needs to be longer range, yeah. The the construction sector is often described as traditional. It's often described as, you know, slow to respond. It can be the complete opposite of that at times. It can be very responsive. But there's a range of stakeholders and obviously the, the um, financial models that are required to support the built environment sector and the way we build things uh, need to be mobilised around doing that. And that does take time. And that is, they need to have confidence in what is happening regarding government policy, government plans, et cetera, and so on. Uh, and that will allow investment in innovation and R&D and, and so on, knowing that it will, in the fullness of time, be effective. It will indeed, yeah, absolutely. All of the innovation that we've talked about so far, Graham, we, we've, we've talked seemingly very much from the perspective of new build. Mm. In one of our earlier episodes, we talked a lot, um, and, well, in fact, entirely about retrofit. Um, as a way of addressing sustainability issues. Um, is there room for innovation in retrofit as well? Absolutely there is. And um, I, I think matching the, the current and new technologies that are emerging and uh, enabling them to fit and work with our historic building stock is super important. You know, so many of the buildings in 2050 have already been built. It's something like 80%. They already exist. So retrofit is a massive challenge, as we know. I think when we think about innovation, we need to think about the skills associated with that, though. Okay. And we need to think in terms of the skills that are needed to retrofit the skills that are needed to maintain our current building stock 
and that's important. But we've also got challenges there because we've got an aging population. People are retiring with those skills. Mm -hmm. And then how do we retrain people to have the skills to work in those with those buildings? Um, so that's a really interesting point for us about how to move forwards. And, and presumably that that's skills at both um, both points within this. It's, it's, it's professional skills, but also those um, trades, on, on-site trades and on-site skills as well. Yeah, it, it is. And there's, you know, I, I, would, I don't need to rehearse the long narrative around uh, how apprenticeships were um, disbanded by various governments and then been reconstituted and reimagined, um, let's say. Um, but we do have a, have a skill shortage around the, the operative on-site, the specialist on-site for doing particular craft skills as we would see them. That is um, a, a, a real challenge, again, I keep using that word, but it is a real challenge for us in how we um, think about buildings for the future, how we can train people to have those skills for the, the modern innovative technologies, okay, uh, to, to work with those, but also how we can maintain our current building stock. So there's two sides to that kind of innovative skill shortage. Yeah. Yeah. And it's borne out by looking, you know, the, the apprenticeships angle is an interesting one. Um, post-2017, that the number of, or proportion and number of level two and level three apprenticeships, those trade skills, mm. it still hasn't recovered from the pre-apprenticeship levy era. Um, and whilst wider apprenticeships has given us an opportunity to to explore lots of other skill areas, that level two and level three trade skills um, is definitely not as, as strong in apprenticeships as it, as it was seven years ago, eight years ago. If we think about future generations and what uh, types of work they might want to be doing, what types of work they might want to train to do, it might be difficult for them to understand what will be the new technology to train in associated with a building. If they want to work as an operative in the construction sector, it might be, well, is that going to be relevant in 10 years' time? Will that be replaced with something different, something new? Am I being trained in what will become an obsolete kind of um, area in 10 years' time? So that is a challenge for us. And that comes back to this idea of having a strategic view view of the sector and what it will look like. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's an interesting one at the moment and, and particularly with the, the rise of AI and and, mm. and so on. Um, I, you would imagine from sitting here in 2024 that AI will not at any point in the future become um, capable of restoring historic <laughs> buildings and so on, but um, it's definitely a consideration. It is. Uh, there, are organ there are companies that now have got a lot of um, AI built into their um, either exoskeletons or their um, autonomous skeletons, as it were, right. that can actually physically do work. So the robotics side of the sector is growing rapidly. It's drawing upon work from the military. It's drawing upon work from manufacturing. And there are um, trials of these types of um, innovations being used on site at the moment, whereby the... Um, the robotic entity, if you like, controlled by AI, can plaster a wall, can do bricklaying, can do all sorts of things. But I come back to the point around unintended consequences and what knock-on effect that might have for parts of the sector, um, which is an interesting debate to have. Absolutely. And one I think we can probably create a whole new episode about and come back <laughs> on another day and talk about in some detail. Um, Graham, I think that brings us to a, a natural close for today. Um, thank you very much for your time you. uh, and for your, your input. If you enjoyed that point, please do subscribe to this podcast. You can do so at Apple, Spotify or YouTube. And if you would like to comment, um, there is information in the description and the show notes to enable you to do so. Um, feel free to disagree with anything Graham has said. Um, there's nothing he likes more than a lively debate. Um, but uh, we also welcome any contributions or any thoughts for future episodes. Thank you.